I'm very close to making a decision. Have not made it official yet, obviously. Have not made it final, but we're very close to making a decision. Probably be decided tonight or tomorrow sometime by 12 o'clock, and we're going to all be meeting at 9 o'clock. And uh, we have a great country, folks. We have a great country. Thank you very much. Evening everyone, welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton and this is the home of positive populism. That was President Trump earlier today saying he's very close to making his decision on the new Supreme Court nominee and we as a nation are very close to learning his choice. We're now exactly 24 hours away from the announcement of who will replace Justice Kennedy on the nation's highest court. A decision that could shape the future of this country for decades. We'll have much more on the countdown to the SCOTUS pick later in the show with an amazing legal panel including experts who've clerked for Justices Scalia and Thomas and Candace Owens, Steve Clemens and Kristen Soltis Anderson will be here for the hour. But first, political realignment in America. Are we moving from left versus right to populist versus elitist? Now, you're going to think I've gone completely crazy, but just bear with me for a moment. And when you get to the end, you'll see what I'm talking about. California Governor Jerry Brown recently signed a bill banning local governments in the state from passing new soda taxes. What's wrong with that? You may say soda taxes are bad. Banning them is good. But how it happened will disgust you and says deep things about our politics and government. The American Beverage Association represents soft drink giants like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. They funded a California ballot measure that would have put across the board restrictions on all local taxation in California. To avoid that, state politicians gave the soda industry what they really wanted, the ban on soda taxes. Again, this is not about whether you like local taxes or not. It's about the rights of local people enshrined in the 10th Amendment to make the decision. Those rights were assaulted, and let's be clear, not by the shadowy American Beverage Association, but by those who hide behind things like that to avoid accountability, the big businesses themselves. People like this man, the CEO of Coca-Cola, James Quincy, who attacked American democracy in this disgraceful way. But he's not the only one. He is just the latest and most blatant example of the big business takeover of America. Over the past few decades, anonymous technocrats, bureaucrats, and corporate apparatchiks built an axis of elitism between big business and big government through donations, lobbying, and the infamous revolving door. In turn, politicians built a bipartisan consensus backing globalization, automation, centralization, and unlimited immigration. Power shifted from local people and local government to distant, unaccountable and often unelected overlords. The result? In the economy, the rich got richer while working people saw their incomes go down and their jobs go away. And meanwhile, in our society, the human ties of family and community were ripped apart with nothing but arid techno-commercialism to take their place. So now, as we see its failures in all their cruelty, who will stand up to the axis of elitism? Not the establishment Republicans, they're a central part of it. But can they change? Previous efforts to reform the GOP focused on demographics. Let's make the party more appealing to young voters, to urban centers, more favorable to immigration. In other words, more appealing to the exact group of people who benefited from this elitism rather than those who lost out from it. Donald Trump overturned all of that. He exposed elitism's corruption by pointing out that establishment politicians were the puppets of their donors. And he spoke up for the victims of elitism, not the victors. At the same time, Bernie Sanders exposed elitism on the Democratic side in just the same way. He spoke up for just the same people and supported many of the same policies as Donald Trump on trade, on immigration, even on health care, where they both argued for universal coverage. So, there could be a massive political realignment underway, from left versus right to populist versus elitist. In Italy, of all places, we just saw this realignment take over the government, with left and right uniting to form a populist administration. It's not just in Italy, of course, populism is winning right across the world. But to attract new supporters to the movement, we need to make sure it's positive and that it delivers real results for working people. That is the next revolution we need. And I've got a big announcement for you about that at the end of tonight's show. 
Tell me what you think of what I've just said at NextRevFNC and at Steve Hilton X. Tonight, joining me to discuss, Washington Editor-at-Large for The Atlantic and National Journal, Steve Clemens, and columnist for The Washington Examiner and author of The Selfie Vote, Kristen Soltis Anderson. So excited to have you both here. Smart, fun group of people to discuss this deep, deep issue that, that I know we've all in different ways been looking at for a long time. Kristen, I want to start with you. You wrote recently something fascinating about, about the GOP and about the Republican, Republican Party and the different kind of camps within it. Tell us what your analysis was. So if you're talking about what the Republican Party looks like, 90% of Republican voters support President Trump. They approve of the job he's doing. They may have quibbles here and there. Maybe they don't love the tweets. But by and large, Republican voters are pretty united around the president. Mm -hmm. But Republicans in Washington, it's fascinating. There are, in my column, I write about four different types of Republicans that you meet in the swamp. Okay. Uh, there's the, the Republican who is the, the sort of Trump acolyte, who Donald Trump has done to the Republican Party what they have always wanted. They uh -huh. wanted it to be tough on immigration, tough on trade. Donald Trump was their first choice in the Republican primary. Not a ton of them in Washington, but folks like Stephen Miller, who have been very influential in the administration, right. kind of fit that mold. The second group, Republican establishment. The folks you were just talking about, folks who've been in power a long time, you know, their job is to fight for whoever's wearing the red jerseys. And if that's Donald Trump and he's won the White House, mm -hmm. they're going to fight for Donald Trump. Even though they may not necessarily love it or believe it. Even though they may not right. love it, and especially on issues like trade, foreign policy, there are still divides in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, those Republican establishment folks kind of are keeping their mouths shut, in part because Donald Trump's their guy. He's appointing someone to the Supreme Court. He's do, he's putting points on the board for the GOP agenda broadly, mm -hmm. so they try not to criticize him too mm -hmm. much. Then there's the never Trump folks, which are sort of Republicans who have almost left the party. Um, it's not almost left. I mean, recently we've had you know actual people. You know, George Will. What is it? What was he saying? He vote, vote against the GOP this November. A conservative, you know, guru saying vote for the Democrats. That's right. That they're they're so appalled by what has happened. Joe Scarborough, another Trump. one, right? He, yes. I mean, I don't know. A lot of people may not want him to, well, to remember that he was part of the GOP in the yeah, first place. He, given, he was a Republican. That's right. He Max Boot. All these. I left the Republican Party. Now I want Democrats to take over. It's quite a theme. Right. And, and that's a pretty big departure from from saying I was a Republican just a couple of years ago. And, and they believe that fundamentally the changes Donald Trump has brought to the party have made the party unrecognizable. They want nothing to do with it. There's a fourth group that I talked about, which I joke is sort of the least organized of all of them. Right. You know, if you are a Trump fan, you have the White House. If you are a Republican, Republican establishment person, you have Congress, you have the RNC. If you're never Trump, you know, they have PACs, they have fundraised, they have donors. But then there's this last group, which tries to take things issue by issue. When Trump does something good, they'll praise him. When he does something bad, they'll criticize him. I jokingly call them the remnant, named after a podcast by Jonah Goldberg. Right. Uh, but it's basically for those who they'll criticize Trump when they think he's wrong but they'll praise him when they think he's right. And there are actually okay. very few of them in Washington. So Steve, you're a, you're a man about town, man about this town, the swamp. Um, how do you see this, particularly my, my distinction there between, well, well just looking at the, 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 the populist movement, not just in the Republican Party, but also in the Democrats. Look, I, 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 I think you capture something with that framing that is forgotten. When I go to Oklahoma, when I go to Iowa, when I go around the country and I meet a lot of different people, much like Kristen just you know spoke about, people wanted a wrecking ball. And so you may call uh, populism uh, the wrecking ball. Uh, people don't necessarily know they're populist. I mean, in the old left-right divide, people had a sense where they were on the left and right. Today, I don't know whether the people know whether they're populist or elitist in terms of how they do it. But they wanted change, mm -hmm. and I think that they didn't feel. And I, th a lot of my relatives who voted for Donald Trump um, did so because they felt demeaned by a system that had forgotten their service to the country, that they fought in wars, mm -hmm. that they came back and saw their job shipped off to the Philippines or India, uh, and were not getting the social contract that New York finance was. So I would frame it more Wall Street versus Main Street. That the rise okay. of finance undermined. A lot of the, those can be your well, elites. I buy that. I mean, I think know, that's and, right. And I think Main Street and where real work happens and people. Uh, throw themselves into that and they think there's a social contract that will reward them and allow their kids to grow up in a system that they've invested right. in and built, that that got undermined somehow by New York financial types. Right. So that's and where I think you're right, but I would just go a little bit further in that. Okay, and yeah. I think that those New York financial types you speak of, the, you know, that wasn't just the Republicans, that was the Democrats. That's right, well, it was Bob Rubin, it was Larry in, Summers, um, yeah. Bring in Candace sure. Owens now from Turning Point USA. Candace, so great to see you again. Um, tell me what you think of this, this change that, that seems 
seems to have happened in the Republican Party really quickly under President Trump, which is that it has just ditched some of those ideological principles that seem to have kind of been there forever with the Republicans and really seems to be now a party that is for working people. Are you comfortable with that or did you prefer the old establishment GOP? Well, look, I came over from the left and I grew up in a family full of Democrats, so I love what Donald Trump is doing. He actually brought me over to the conservative side. And the one thing that I always say is that I don't believe that Donald Trump is a Democrat or a Republican. This is something entirely new that doesn't quite have a name yet. He's just an American. And the movement is really towards Americanism and all of these things that we abandoned over the years as we drew more into, I guess, more socialist ideas. And when he started talking about the swamp, people started realizing that we had an opportunity to get this country back. I almost feel like we were brainwashed and we were kind of sleeping and Donald Trump was sort of the bulldozer into our ideas to make us understand we are on the brink of losing this country. So I think that he was just a necessary response to an establishment um, that was completely abandoning the American people. I think that's really right. And, and I think the, the key thing, Candice, is that he's, he's not ideological. He's kind of, look, you may not always get it right. I know there's lots of grounds to criticize him, etc. But you know, he's pragmatic, it seems to me. His default approach to things is like, okay, here's a problem, how do I solve it, right? And I think people like that. That's exactly right. They like that. They like that he speaks like a normal person, not like a politician. I know that some of the established Republicans do not like his tweets. They don't like his manner of communication. But even that feels more authentic when he's speaking to us. We had Obama and everything he said sounded perfect, but the country was an absolute disaster. We actually are saying that we are we don't want politics anymore. This seems to be the end of political correctness. Mm -hmm. And it was a very necessary death if we wanted to see this country move in the right direction. So, Kristen, you're, you're in touch with the voters as well as the swamp dwellers here in D.C. You do a lot of opinion research. How's this playing out um, out, out in the country with, with real voters? Well, you've got Republicans who are solidly behind the president. You've got Democrats who are solidly opposed to the president. His job approval has barely budged during the time that he has been in office, despite the fact that the news feels very chaotic and mm -hmm. it feels like the news cycle is always crazy. I mean, he took office with people kind of dug into their sides and very few people willing to move. And so as a result, Donald Trump's job approval is, is not great, but it's also unclear that anyone else being president right. wouldn't necessarily have a higher job approval because of the, the polarization that we have. And right. I think a big problem Democrats are going to have in the midterms is if their message message is we want obstruction, mm -hmm. we want to cause more chaos, we want to stop things. There are a lot of voters in the middle that don't like the tweets, they don't love everything about Donald Trump, but obstruction, they more chaos, well. I don't know that that's what they want. So Steve, just a very quick final thought from you on this. Um, what do you see, do you see any yeah. prospect of a kind of bringing together of, of the, the, the right and left versions of populism, a bit like you've seen in Italy, some of the Bernie Sanders ideas? Well, I think a realignment is, is coming one way or another and I don't think that, that either party has a monopoly on where that's going to land. So you could see an Elizabeth Warren, you could see a Bernie Sanders rise and grab that kind of working American who's very frustrated with how they've been treated. And you're going to find, you're going to find that you know, shake out. And you could find, you know, Donald Trump came along. I loved your previous comment. said, neither Republican nor Democrat, he seems. He hijacked a party in a party apparatus. That could happen to the Democratic Party establishment as well. So we're living in a very fluid time. Yeah. And in that very fluid time, that realignment could look very, very different uh, than we see things as they are today. I, I, I so agree. And I and I also, to, to what Candace was saying, I think that, um, you know, we, we what's exciting is, is sort of putting together the the kind of agenda that this could mean in terms of real um, change. And uh, we haven't figured out exactly what it's called. I call it positive populism, but there we are. Um, <laughs> TP. There you go. Coming, <laughs> coming up later, we've got it. We're going to focus on tonight's really uh, big news coming up to, on, on uh, with the president's announcement. Tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to talk about their Supreme Court uh, nomination. We're going to have a legal discussion about that next, and then we're going to talk about the political implications. It's going to be a really big story. Don't go away.
Welcome back, everyone. In less than 24 hours, President Trump will announce his choice to replace Justice Kennedy on the U.S. Supreme Court. That choice will determine the future of American judicial decisions for decades to come. Here to break it all down, Candace Owens is back with us, former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Scalia and president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Ed Whelan, and former law clerk to Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and chief counsel and policy director to the Judicial Crisis Network, Carrie Severino. Ed, let me uh, start with you here. Um, we've got these four candidates that seem to be in the frame. Um, I'm just going to do a sort of quick pen portrait. I'm sure you'll tell me that I'm being unfair, but you've got Amy Coney Barrett, seen as the social conservative, Brett Kavanaugh, seen as the kind of establishment um, pick of the four, Raymond Kethledge, as kind of Midwestern, a bit of a populist, um, and Thomas Hardiman, a strong conservative. Those are the kind of, that's how they're being seen. But the question I wanted to start start you off on is what's more interesting about these four candidates is it the differences the slight differences between them or is it the similarities what how should our audience see it well I think it's really the similarities I mean you can emphasize some uh, differences or apparent differences among them but I think what you have is four outstanding candidates who recognize what the role of the Supreme Court justice is who are committed to principles of originalism and textualism who have careers demonstrating those commitments and any of these would be outstanding picks for the Supreme Court. Carrie, what do you think about that? I absolutely agree. I mean, they're, they're different flavors. You've got different different types of backgrounds coming for each one. And uh, they're all different ways that I think you can see that the left is already getting ready with its attacks. So there's going to be different parts of each of their records. They're going to shoehorn into their predetermined uh, talking points and angles of attack. But at the end of the day, any one of these would be such a great pick. I don't know who I would choose. It's really a great problem to have. I think the president's right. got a, a challenge and it seems like he's having trouble deciding. But what a great problem to have. And Candace, what's your take? Um, do you do you feel that these uh, again would you be happy with any of them or do you have uh, a particular direction that you'd prefer the, the the president to go look I agree with everyone here there are there are very strong candidates across the board and he can't really go wrong and I'm just waiting for him to make the pick so that we can already see what the left is going to do here with their drama with their hyperbole telling <laughs> us the world is going to end every single day and yet somehow we get up the next day and everything is fine so, Ed, I, I think that's such a good description of what's been going on. Ed, I'd, like, I'd love you to talk from a legal perspective about one thing that caught my eye this week in all the discussion around this, which was the, the point was made that actually the left, as Candace was just saying, uh, you know, they're really kind of getting all up in arms about it. But what they're really responding to is the possibility that something they've got used to for a long time, which is the ability to advance policy goals through the court rather than through the legislative branch, which was the proper place for that kind of action. That may be coming to an end, and, and that's the real significance of this, not one more other particular policy. Right, they recognize that progressivism is not, in fact, very popular, and they've been able to achieve a lot of their goals through the courts, and they're concerned now that the, the courts will not be uh, inventing rights that they favor and wiping out rights that they disfavor. And so where, where, where would you point to to argue that the approach that these nominees would take is the correct one. What's that based on? Well, ultimately, it's based in what we lawyers call um, originalism, uh, public meaning uh, originalism, the concept that the law has definite meaning, that in order to understand what that meaning is, we need to look back and see what it meant at the time it was adopted. We understand that in our system of government, justices do not have free reign to uh, impose their own views. Their job is to interpret the law and apply it. And I think what we see is a huge divide between the conservative theory theory of jurisprudence uh, and the, 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 the liberal theory, which amounts to little more than justices can make things up to adapt the living constitution to changing circumstances to address whatever needs um, they think are so pressing. Like basically another branch of the political um, part of government, right? I absolutely. I think, I think the problem is what we've seen is a lot of judges who are just using the courts as an alternate means to advance their policy goals. The mm -hmm. policy is supposed to be done by the legislature. And uh, well, all we want here, frankly, I, I, I don't think any of these people is going to advance conservative policy goals, particularly. Their job is to simply look at the law, and that could be laws that were written and passed by Democratic Congress and President or Republican one. They could be ones with liberal policy goals or conservative ones. But their job is to simply 
interpret the law. That really should be a message that appeals across the board, because that means that the legislating power is being done by your elected representatives. That's how our Constitution sets it up. And I think that's why all of these people, they're so fair-minded. They're known for giving both sides mm -hmm. a fair shake. I think they're all going to be excellent on that. And that means it's not you're not going to get a, a wish list, a, a laundry list of things you want the judge to do. Just let's give us all a fair shake so that we can let the legislator do it, its job. It sounds so reasonable, Carrie. C Candace, I know you were uh, you were agreeing with that. Um, you got, I mean, the, the thing that you, you're hearing all the time from the left on this is Roe versus Wade. They're going to overturn Roe versus Wade. It's such a good <laughs> example of what Carrie's just been talking about. What's your take on that? Look, the Roe versus Wade is just fear mongering. That's what they do all the time. They want people to think that every decision that Donald Trump makes means that they're no longer going to be able to live their lives. So um, everyone gets scared, everyone gets upset, and it's not the reality. All they are simply going to do is uphold the Constitution. The problem is, for so long, the left has not had to play by the rules. They have not played fair. So now that they have to, they're all upset and in arms. And look, I'm very excited to see what Donald Trump does here. We're very excited that he got a second pick. and. Everything is going to be fine, liberals. <laughs> I think that's. Uh, I know it's just amazing to see the the, re, the, the reaction, though, Candace. I think that uh, you you got in a tangle. I, I noticed earlier this week when it was just very interesting. To I, I watched that. I really enjoyed it because it was so interesting the way you confronted someone um, on another network with that exact point, and they just didn't really know what to make of it. It was great. Right. Yeah, it was great. And I said to him, uh, Obama got two SCOTUS picks. And he said, well, we're just upset that he didn't get a third. And I said, I mean, that's not even a, a legitimate response. That's not a criticism. So you're saying that you're upset that things are fair, you know, and that's really what it comes down to. They've been living by nobody's rules but their own for so long that they don't know how to play the game fairly. They don't understand the Constitution. And they use, they employ all of these tactics, the media to fear monger and to get people upset and boycotting about things that fundamentally they don't even understand. Yeah, great point. Uh, Ed, last quick word to you on this. Um, what's your um, what's your hope that you know after after the immediate sort of focus on the fight? Wh wh do you think it will change the way people actually see the, this branch of government that people can actually come to accept the validity of what you're saying? Or is that a, a forlorn hope? Well, I hope so. Um, look, look, this could be just one of several steps um, in the process. I hope, for example, this helps Republicans retain control of the Senate in November's elections. So, so if there's another Supreme Court vacancy uh, down the road or two or three more, uh, we can get more good picks. But I think it, um, as the American people see a, um, a Supreme Court that is genuinely constitutionalist, I think they'll come to appreciate its merits. Right. Don't tell the Democrats about two or three more picks. They're going to completely uh, lose their minds. Thank you both very much. Um, thank you, Carrie and Ed and Candace. You're going to stay with us. Up next, Steve Clemens and Kristen Salters Anderson are also back with Candace to discuss the political implications of President Trump's Supreme Court pick. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. No matter who President Trump chooses as his Supreme Court nominee tomorrow, there's sure to be massive political fallout. Back to discuss all that are Candace, Steve, and Kristen. So, um, Steve, there was something I saw, uh, a story that, that I thought was very interesting. Um, these four candidates that seem to be on the short list, uh, Mitch McConnell, apparently, gave a nudge to President Trump, I think that's how it was put, to say that of those four, two in particular, Raymond Keflage and Thomas Hardiman, would be easier to get through um, in terms of the confirmation, whether you like Mitch McConnell or not. And I know a lot of our audience really don't like him. Um, you know, he is running this show. And it particularly was interesting to me that Brett Kavanaugh, who's been sort of put forward as the more establishment candidate, Mitch McConnell is saying, don't try him. He's got this long record. There's so much there. Uh, and the Democrats could use that to delay the process. This was the interesting bit, to delay the process beyond November. So you don't actually get this person confirmed before the elections. Now, but what that made me think, this is a question, sorry, it's a big long setup. But my, my question is, why is that bad for President Trump? The bit I don't understand about the politics of all this is, People say, well, get the new person confirmed before November. Isn't that actually better politics uh, the, the, in terms of a motivator to leave it open? Then the Senate really is a huge, there's something huge at stake. Mitch McConnell knows his chamber, and I think he also knows President Trump. And in my book, the biggest problem in delaying that so that you could have a delay
delayed confirmation process that could conceivably run past November if you brought one of the controversial candidates in, President Trump himself becomes the uncertain factor. What he might tweet, what he might say, what he might do, and it may not always play well with the base in terms of what he's doing. So I think that that the that Mitch McConnell's making the, the, the judgment that getting someone through, showing that Donald Trump can get someone through, get them confirmed, rush it through, is a bigger sign of confidence and place and success before an election uh, than having somebody that, that, that gets stalled through the process. So do you think this is a real motivator for people to go and vote? Let's just take what, both sides. Let's do Republicans and, and, and Democrats. I think if the, if the vote happens or the confirmation happens before the election, it is less a factor in the election because it will be something in the rearview mirror. And right. there's always something new that's right. come up. But it was a reminder to the bases of both parties of what's at stake. If it is saved for after, after the election, in some ways it can be a motivator in the same way that the open seat that became the seat held right. by Neil Gorsuch was motivational for a lot of conservatives who had grave reservations about Donald Trump on a number of fronts, but thought, you know what, I want a Republican picking who's in that seat. Now, I think the, the danger in letting this go past November is right now in the Senate, you have an awful lot of red state Democrats mm -hmm. who are up for election this year. who are going to have to answer to a lot of Trump voters. Why did they obstruct the president's nominee? Mm -hmm. And so get them on record, get them voting now before the election when the pressure is at maximum to say, don't obstruct the president. Right. So, um, Candace, you hear all the time these days that the Democrats, the resistance and all that, they're really fired up, ready to go for November, but they're on the Republican side. You know, there's a bit of, bit of a motivation problem. Do you, first of all, do you think that that is accurate? And secondly, do you think this Supreme Court um, the issue will solve any motivational problem that they may or may not be on the Republican side? You know, I don't necessarily think that there's a motivational problem on the Republican side. I think the left is always louder, um, and you can always <laughs> bank on that. They're always going to be louder and making more noise and talking about a blue wave, you know, and telling us that Hillary Clinton is going to win by 100 percent. So you, you can always bank on that on the left. So it doesn't necessarily determine what's, what the outcome is. I actually think that we are extremely excited on the Republican side um, that we're seeing. I mean, everything is positive. Everything is amazing. The economy is up. 3.7 million jobs added. And, you know, I have have to agree that pushing this pick as soon as possible, getting this person confirmed um, is, is the way to go. You don't want to wait and drag this out because we also want to encourage them to do what they do best, obstruct, you know, give us more talking points to show people what they are. They've become the party of obstruction, of violence and of hate and of just resisting this president at every single turn. And we see more and more examples of that. I mean, people are really listening to the Maxine Waters injunction to go and, you know, hassle people wherever they may, may be. I with Steve Bannon today. But let's just go back to the, um, the sorry, just uh, that was about Steve Bannon, I think, being challenged in a bookstore in Virginia, if people haven't been following the news today. Big news about Steve Bannon. Um, Have you been challenged anywhere? Not yet, but no. don't tempt people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, uh, Chris and I wanted to come back to the, 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 elect, the red state Democrats. So interesting in all this. Do you really think that, you know, they're sitting there thinking, well, you know, I've got this difficult choice. You know, if I vote for the nominee, then that's going to really um, help me with the, uh, my election. But it's going to really going to, you know, hurt my party. Is that really true? If they vote against President Trump's nominee, is that really going to risk their election? Is, is, is it such a big factor? Well, in order for a lot of these red state Democrats to win re-election, they need a lot of folks that voted for Donald Trump to nonetheless turn out and check the box for them. Them, even though they've got the word Democrat after their name. And so they need to be able to demonstrate that they're the type of person that when the president does something good, that they will go along, that they will support him, that they will try to help right. him out. And so I think what matters in this case about who is chosen is does the president choose someone who, whether through their paper trail or something they say in their confirmation hearings, gives some of these red state Democrats an out, gives them an excuse to say, well, if the president had nominated someone mainstream, I would have gone for it but this person is a bridge too far because right. of X, Y, or Z. Do they find some kind of quasi-credible excuse? Because they'll be looking for one. Look, your previous guest just said of the four that all four are good choices, but two of them are are ones that you'll really instantly get Joe Manchin, Heidi Heitkamp, and Joe Donnelly, and that ends the debate right there. So who, two, who are they? Which well, I would say the the, the the two that Mitch McConnell pushed forward. Right. You know, uh, Catherine and, and, and Hardiman. And, 
And Hardiman is interesting because he was up last time. It'd be interesting if he didn't get picked again, he'd be left at the altar twice. Uh, but but I think that in that case, I think Kristen's absolutely right. You've got these red state Democrats who are up, right. and there are a lot of them up this next time, but particularly Joe Manchin in West Virginia, Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota, and, and Joe Donnelly. You've got uh, a case for them. If it, if it becomes something where you get an ex what right. feels to be an ideologically extreme selection, it gives well, them a way out on that. We'll note. see. And also, you may lose Susan Collins. And I got to tell you that there are folks like Jeff, Jeff, Jeff uh, Flake and oh, uh, Bob Corker that I think may want to make this a legacy stamp as they depart the chamber. Don't bring them into it. Just drive everyone <laughs> crazy. Uh, we have to leave it there. We'll know a lot more 24 hours from now. Thank you uh, to all of you. Coming up, it's a Swamp Watch success story. EPA administration administrator Scott Pruitt resigns amid an onslaught of scandals. We'll bring you all the details, plus the latest swampy dealings of another member of President Trump's cabinet. Kristen, Steve and Candace will be uh, with us to discuss that after the break. Thank you. As you know, on Swamp Watch, we call it as we see it, without fear or favor. And back in April, I called for President Trump to fire Scott Pruitt for undermining the president's drain the swamp agenda. Watch. None of President Trump's appointees have been under more scrutiny for swampy behavior than EPA Chief Scott Pruitt. When Pruitt requested enormous pay raises for his staff, including a $29,000 raise for his scheduling director, the White House rejected the request, but Pruitt didn't let that stop him. He reportedly used an obscure provision in the Safe Drinking Water Act to force the raises through. For a cut price rate, Pruitt rented a condo co-owned by the wife of an energy lobbyist whose firm conducted business before the EPA that same year. What we need is for President Trump to take the lead, fire Scott Pruitt and throw out the lobbyists from his administration. Well, this week, President Trump did, in fact, accept Scott Pruitt's resignation amid even more scandals stacking up, including reportedly asking an aide to help find his wife a $200,000 a year job. Draining the swamp is a long overdue crusade against a corrupt and rotten system. And as we show you every week, the corruption and rot is on both sides of the aisle. That's why it took a political outsider like Donald Trump to lead this crusade. But it's got to be consistent. Corruption is no more acceptable in one party than the other. And it's no more acceptable in an effective politician than a useless one either. This is not about left versus right or about turning a blind eye if someone is carrying out policies we happen to like. This is about creating a government that works for the benefit of the people, not itself. By accepting Scott Pruitt's resignation, President Trump is taking an important step in that direction and fulfilling his promises. While we're on the subject of people carrying out policies we like, I'm all for Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross's loyal implementation of the president's trade agenda. But you may also remember what we told you about Secretary Ross's shocking conflicts of interest. Here's a quick recap. At the forefront of the Trump administration's trade efforts is Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, who, it turns out, is no stranger to the steel industry. He's negotiating over South Korean steel imports while making money from importing South Korean steel. In November 2017, eight months after joining the Trump administration, Ross announced that he would divest from Navigator Holdings. But as of today, there is no evidence he's kept that promise. Another client is PetroChina the Chinese state-owned oil and gas company. The brutal communist dictatorship in Beijing may be planning world domination, but hey, let's not let that stop America's commerce secretary doing business with them while in office. Unbelievably, things have actually gotten worse for the secretary. It's now been revealed that Wilbur Ross failed to divest from a number of assets that he promised he would sell in his ethics agreement with the Department of Commerce, including stocks in a company called Invesco. The value of those assets has grown, earning Ross an estimated $1.2 to $6.2 million between the day he promised to sell them and the day he actually sold them. Ross admits the mistake but claims the lapse was not intentional but the result of a misunderstanding. According to Secretary Ross, he didn't sell the stocks because he wasn't aware he owned them. When journalists began contacting the Commerce Department with questions about the story, they referred some of them to Ross's personal lawyer, someone named Ted Cassinger, who repeated that Ross sold the shares as soon as he realized he owned them. No harm, no foul, right? 
We looked into this lawyer's background and found a perfect example of a DC swamp resume. Cassinger is a former lobbyist. He began his DC career at the US International Trade Commission in the late 70s, moved to the Department of State and Department of Finance, and then joined the lobbying firm Vincent and Elkins in the mid 80s. He ran back through the revolving door in the early 2000s, joining the Commerce Department before leaving again to join his current firm, O'Melveny and Myers, where he worked as a lobbyist on behalf of Hess Corporation and Occidental Petroleum in 2008. Who better to defend your swampy ethics lapses than a swamp lawyer who knows all about the business of shady money in Washington? President Trump listened to us over Scott Pruitt. It might be an idea to do the same over Wilbur Ross. Tell us your thoughts on social media at Steve Hilton X and at NextRev FNC. Coming up, Candace, Steve and Kristen have been listening and I want their thoughts on this week's Swamp Watch. That's next. Don't go away. All right, welcome back, everyone. Now let's get Candace, Steve, and Kristen's take on this week's Swamp Watch. Candace, let me go to you first. I mean, you know, it's, don't you agree? It's important that we, you know, we, drain the swamp was a really big part of the president's message. I think it's why a lot of people supported him. Here's someone who's going to shake things up. That's got to that's got to be true for all sides, right, including um, his own cabinet. That's exactly right. Conservatives can't just talk the talk. We have to actually walk the walk. You know, for the eight years that Obama was in office, this was something that we were extremely critical of. Um, if he, if he, in fact, did not divest, and this is in his portfolio, this is a huge problem and it should be addressed. You know, um, he's a smart guy. He's advocated for better deals. So I do want to give credit where credit is due. But this is yeah. not fair. This is exactly what Donald Trump, you know, said that he was going to end when he got into office. He was going to drain the swamp. So you know, it's hurtful to what we say that we represent it, it, it we have to make sure that we make good on what we say we represent and this is not this is not a good show of that well said thank you um you're here um you see all this i mean do you see do you see and we're both here do you see any change in terms of swampiness? Uh, I, not particularly. I think, unfortunately, the reality is that there is a new president in town and he has disrupted the swamp, but new creatures have just put on Make America Great Again hats and have tried to find ways to profit off of this administration. And I think Scott Pruitt was an example of that. You know, he was someone who was putting points on the board for the president's environmental agenda, but at the same time behaving in a way that was totally out of step with what the president promised he would do. And for a president who came to fame in America and over the last decade has had the catchphrase, you are fired, I wish we had heard that out of the president months ago when it came right. to Scott Pruitt. Because this was not just anonymous sources and hearsay and the yeah. media trying to go after him. I mean, these are things, these are his own staffers on record. These are public records that were released. Yeah. I wish it had happened sooner. Steve? Look, there's a lot of talent that wants to help President Trump succeed. This administration regrets regrettably has issued an enormous number of moral and ethical waivers to various people who had served in these swampy positions before. And I think it's something that, in, you know, as they proceed would be very wise to work through. And I, I really applaud you. You should get a gold star uh, for, for succeeding on Pruitt. Uh, and, and, and if it happens with Wilbur Ross, fine. But, you know, unfortunately, there's a long line of others there. And, and I think that what uh, all of our guests have said today, this m makes a sense because you're, you're going to end up being perceived as hypocritical to the folks in Oklahoma, folks in Kansas, folks in Iowa, folks all over the country who heard him say drain the swamp, and yet yeah. you've got swamp creatures that are actually holding you up. And I think that's, Candace, I th that's part of the reality yeah, I, right I, now. I, that's right. Candace, it's last word to you, we don't, uh, just a, a little bit of time. I think there's one aspect I just want to mention, it's very important, which is that um, one aspect of the swamp, perhaps less focused on, is the whole, you know, the, the bureaucracy and the administrative state and the way that big business uses all this regulation to lobby for what it needs instead of small business. To be fair, um, cutting back regulations and getting rid of all of that, that is another version of draining the swamp and that is proceeding very well, don't you think? Absolutely. He has been slashing regulations since he got into office, which is, you know, returning opportunity back to the little man. It's giving us the ability to dream again, to go out and be an entrepreneur without having to worry about all the steps that you have to take um, to even get your foot out of the door. So that is great. And look, it, it's of course, this is going to be an uphill battle. There isn't a magic drain that he can pull and have all of the swamp creatures <laughs> washed away, but he's doing a tremendous job. And I think when pressed, uh, the president always does the right thing. 
There you go. A nice happy note to end on. Thank you so much. <laughs> Coming up, a big announcement for all you positive popular fans out there. You won't want to miss it. Stay with us.